Good evening, family of God. Or oh, you can do better than that. Good evening, family of God. Amen, amen. Thank uh, those who brought me here from the ERLC and the Gospel Coalition. Let's give God a hand. Praise for them for putting this on. Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Stand if you don't mind real quick. I'm reading from the CSB version of the Bible. I'm not going to wait till you get there. I'm just going to start reading. Verse 3 and verse 3 alone. Making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. You may be seated. I have been given the task of talking about unity. Somebody say unity. unity. Um, Dr. King made a statement. He says, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. As I have been in the world of evangelicalism for over two decades, I learned the word evangelical uh, in my intro the to theology class in 1995 on the campus of Dallas Theological Seminary in the intro to theology class, and they kept using this word called evangelical. And I was trying to figure out what in the world is an evangelical. You have to understand, I come from Chocolate City, Washington, D.C., and, 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 and in light of that, I grew up in a climate of post-civil rights, post-black power, black bourgeoisie, post-hippie generation, uh, all the way into what we would call the original hip-hop generation. And so as I grew up in that particular milieu, I did not know what an evangelical was, and being the only black student in class around a myriad of light-skinned brothers and sisters, I didn't find myself in the careful company to communicate my ignorance, but I went on a research hunt. We didn't have iPhones and internet back then, so I couldn't just go on real quick, look it up, and act like I knew what I was talking about, like most of us do today. But what I had to do was I had to go on a search. Somebody say a search. Went on a search to look at what evangelicalism is, and as I began to see what evangelicalism is, all of the things from the historic Christian faith and its doctrine, all the way into uh, even talking about justice, I was like, boom, I'm cool with that. I'm down with evangelicalism. And so what I did was I went on a, 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 a pilgrimage of going to evangelical schools. I went uh, to, to pilgrimages embracing evangelical theology, embracing its pillars, and embracing every different thing that would make me evangelicalized, if you will. And I marinated in evangelical culture, spoke at any conference that you could think of uh, where leading evangelical speakers were. I immersed myself in evangelical culture. But as I began to go on this journey, I began to notice that there were some diametrical differences between the doctrine and the duty. And as I began to see diametric differences between the doctrine and the duty, I began to do like a few Christians have, my uh, African Americans, my Boricua, my, 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 my Dominicanos, and also, and also some of my woke white millennials began to back up from evangelicalism. And the reason being is because there was a deep inconsistency. So many of us began to say, man, the heck with it. We're falling back from evangelicalism. We love Jesus. We love the Bible. We love inerrancy. We love justification. We love sanctification. We love glorification. We love all of the solas. We love all of those things. But we don't love the functional orthopraxical culture that doesn't line up with biblical orthodoxy. And so as I began in my mind to give up on evangelicalism, I began to read the book of Ephesians. And the gospel globetrotter himself, Paul, began to walk me through the corridors of theological excellence. In chapter one, he walked me through the triune unity of the triune clique that rose thick. He got in the latter part of that chapter and talked about intimacy. Chapter two, he talked about how every human being is tore up from the floor up and messed up and in need of the desperate grace of God. 
Then he began to talk about by grace are you saved through faith. Then boom, he fast forwards over to chapter three and he begins to talk about the universal mystery of the gospel as shown in and through the church. And then uh, he, took, he put his pen down parenthetically, I believe at the end of that chapter to do a praise break because whenever you have proper theology infused into you, you can't help but lift your hands. You can't help but honor the name of the Lord. So he said, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think according to the power that is at work within you. So he got into that and then he got from the orthodoxy to the orthopraxy. Chapter one through three is about your doctrine, but chapter four through six is about your duty and sandwiched between spiritual warfare and weighty theology is the unity of the church. So we come here to this verse, and there are unavoidable exegetical items in here that I cannot avoid even as an African American. I want to give up and shoot the longest jumper away from evangelicalism. But the Bible won't let me, Paul says, that he, he wants us to attain to the unity of the faith later. What, what convicted me is he said, make every effort. As I look at the idea of making every effort, it means be diligent to preserve something. In making every effort, it's a present active participle, meaning that it's a verbal adjective. It's not just supposed to be what you do, it's who you are. So making every effort is something that we as believers cannot help but functionally pursue. But the challenge is, is we're having opportunities and times where we're getting together where the effort becomes frustrating because even just as far as last week, we had Stephon Clark shot at 20 times in his backyard. And if you know anything about being in the hood, if somebody's running after you with a gun and says, hold up, you don't care if it's the police, Jojo, Elizabeth, or whoever it is, you running because there's a gun. And now we're not even as believers being on the same page with that and going retroactively back with this reality. And so now I'm stuck with the tension of standing here, wrestling through the fact that the Bible demands that we pursue unity. As it says we pursue unity, it asks, it asks us to keep or preserve. That means to continue what has already been secured. So unity is twofold, actually threefold. Unity was secured by Jesus on the cross. Jesus will ultimately come back, wreck shop, and functionally put us in the unity that he bought us in. So the problem isn't the cross and the resurrection, and the, pro and the problem isn't the eschatological reality of our union with one another. It's the dash in the middle. And in that dash in the middle, we have to wrestle with and fight with the reality of what in the heck does it mean for particularly black believers and white believers to fight for unity. I got a couple of things and then I promise I'm out your way. What unity doesn't look like is number one, ignoring the, the impact of the past on the present. One of the things as a pastor in counseling people as a part of my regular pastoral regimen is when they come to meet with me, first question is, how do you come to, come to know the Lord? And the second question is, talk to me about your family. And the reason why I talk to them about their family is because I know, and many counselors in here know too well, that it's impossible to deal with the issues in this person's life unless they're saved and unless you deal with the family history that put the person that's in front of you in front of you. Black and white evangelicals, we have to go back to our familiar history. Next year is gonna be 400 years from 1619 when the first black slaves made their way into German, uh, 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 Jamestown. And what we're gonna to have to ask ourselves the question of, what does our familial past have to do with our familial present? Some of my white brothers and sisters act like our family history in the past has nothing to do with our family present. But I rebuke that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and I call you to repentance, to begin to stop asking us to give you books. Stop asking us to do research. Listen, y'all were able to do mathematic equations through some black women but then your own stuff and to be able to go to the moon and put a flag in it and dance around and do the West Coast strut. 
How in the world can you go from the earth to the moon and you can't do research on the racial history that we need to fight in this country? I don't want to be traumatized by teaching you history. I want you to grow up in your spiritual maturity and grow up in your faith and go on the sanctifying journey of overriding the patriotic, patriotic way that we've learned history in America. We have patriotic and triumphalism in the ways that we've learned history. And so when you talk to African Americans, now you have on one side, you have a, 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 a white frailty. Then on the other side, uh, you, you, you have blacks who are dealing with race fatigue syndrome. So you got race fatigue meeting white frailty. White frailty says, I, 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 I refuse to talk about that. Bl 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 black, blacks on the other side, I'm sick of going back and forth with you about it. But the question is, we have to begin in our walk with Jesus Christ to say, I am not going to let the challenges of what has happened, much as I ain't feeling you. I'm going to tell you right now, multiplicities of Negroes ain't feeling evangelicalism. But one of the things I've been, God's been working on me in my heart is that the root of bitterness sprouting up would defile many. And if I allow myself to stew in my frustration towards whites, Jesus won't be my center, my hatred will. But on the other hand, whites have to do this, assume in Jesus' mighty name that because there is offense, an offense that you need to press into that particular offense and begin to educate yourself on beginning to develop the opportunity to not have reductionistic ways in which you try to cause racial reconciliation, like through hiring non-qualified African Americans to be the multi-ethnic engineers in your local churches. And you know they're not qualified because blacks haven't hired them. And, and, and it works against unity when you hire somebody that we are not feeling. And you're wondering why multi-ethnicity isn't happening at your church. It's because you have a person that's black on the outside but angloid on the inside. If we're going to do unity together, we have to have less reductionistic strategies and begin to get at the table and look at the glory of Christ's commitment to say, yes, we have problems. Yes, we have issues and yes, we have frustrations. So every now and then as these two minutes go past for me to done, it makes me go to Revelation 7. And I go to Revelation 7. And although the J-dubs, they stop at verse 8, because they believe 144,000 ministry, we believe in more than that, myriads, and myriads of believers are going to be Pentecostalized in the presence of God and in, in, in looking like their ethnic selves in their different dialects from Australia to ancient Kemet to, uh, to South Africa uh, 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 to Denmark to Greenland uh, 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 to Zambia to ancient Ethiopia, current Ethiopia, America, Afro-Caribbeans, all different peoples from all tribes and languages are going to be around the throne yelling and glorifying the name of Jesus Christ in their tongue. But all of us are going to say, have on the same white outfit. And we're going to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It reminds me, as I close, Philadelphia Eagles just won the championship recently. And I didn't go out in the streets, but I looked out in the streets. One million people, Irish, Italian, Boricua, all different, black folk, Nigeria, everybody is out there in the streets. One million people tearing the streets of Philadelphia up about a game that none of them played. They had on the same color jersey with somebody else's name on the back of it. And all of the differences that they had and all of the frustrations that they had because somebody had won for them, they gathered around the ones who beat the game for them versus fighting 
each other. All I want to tell you today is in heaven, we're going to have on the same jersey. In heaven, we're going to be have on the white robes and we're going to be saying glory and honor and dominion and power to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy, God. We bless you, God. Glory in the highest. Glory adios for unity in the church.